All right, let's begin. Like I said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you all for coming to our Live from the Bruker Lab, where we'll be talking about rapid analysis of microplastics. Uh, for today's webinar, you will receive a live demonstration from our own application scientist, William Fatigante. William Fatigante is an application scientist within the Bruker Applied Mass Spectrometry Division. Um, to, uh, let's see here. He will be concentrating mostly on DART-related applications, and he received his Master's of Science from Illinois State University, where he focused on applying ambient mass spectrometric methods for polymer screening and confirmation. Being with Bruker now for almost a year, William has learned the ins and outs of DART MS and its potential to provide a rapid screening solution to the polymer and plastics community. After William's presentation, there will be a Q&A session, so please feel free to leave your questions in the chat and we will be monitoring them for the end. And also, before we begin, I'd like to remind our audience that they can toggle your view to enlarge your webcam. If you want to get a closer look at what William is demonstrating in the lab today, you can click and hold on the horizontal bar, gray bar on your screen, and drag it up and down to get a larger view of his webcam. And without further ado, William, I will make you the presenter and hand the microphone over to you. All right, thanks for the introduction, Megan. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for joining. Uh, as Megan mentioned, my name's William, and I am here live from our demo facility at Bruker headquarters in Billerica, Massachusetts. So I'm excited to show the instrumentation that I have here behind me. But before I, get, uh, I do that, I'd like to share just a couple of slides about today's event. So during today's event, we're gonna take a brief look at microplastics and talk about some of the instrumentation that Bruker does have to offer. And then I'm gonna in introduce you guys to DART mass spectrometry. And then from that point, we'll begin the live portion of our event uh, where I'll be doing some data acquisition using the DART ion rocket setup on our uh, impact to quadruple time of flight mass spec. And then from there, we'll just go ahead and wrap it up and have a Q&A at the end. So let's begin. So first off, what are microplastics? So by the book, microplastics are any type of plastic fragment less than five millimeters in length. So they have been already detected in water and soil, and also within the stomach contents of animals and even humans. And uh, the major concerns behind microplastics is that there's no historic data. So there's really no backlog of what types of plastics have been produced within the past you know, 50 years. And as we know, there's been uh, wide scale production uh, throughout the world. And also plastics are not included in any regular monitoring programs. So they're greatly underregulated. Um, so it kind of stems to the first problem. So there's really no monitoring of what is being produced and potentially ending up in our environment. And lastly, but most importantly, it's just the lack of knowledge on human and in the environment. So it's to no surprise that microplastics in our environment is not a good thing. But within the next 10, 50, 10 to 50 years, we don't know what kind of impact that the microplastics are going to have on, uh, on us and the environment. And lastly, I just wanted to briefly mention that there's uh, usually two different types of microplastics. So we have a primary microplastic, which is the raw material that's already less than five millimeter in size when it enters our environment. So these are your synthetic fibers. Um, so stemming from when you wash your clothes, uh, some of these synthetic fibers can break off from your clothes and go down the waste, uh, go down with the wastewater and also you know, industrial pellets and microbeads. So it's not as common anymore, but those microbeads that were in your personal care products um, or also some industrial um, you know, uh, cleaning solvents. And then there's secondary microplastics. So these are plastics that are uh, stemming from the degradation of a larger plastic product through natural process. So such as uh, weathering or UV radiation. So these are uh, the primary source of these are bottles, takeout containers or plastic bags. So uh, when these items are polluted, 
or throughout the years when they're weathered, um, these smaller microplastics can break off from this larger primary source. And I just wanted to jump to a different track and talk about additives. Now, I'm not gonna get too in depth into the production of polymers, but one thing that's uh, very common across all polymer production is the introduction of additives to the, the polymer. And additives are used to help protect, uh, protect the polymer against degradation during its life cycle. Um, so the reason why additives are there uh, is that it, it prevents them from degradation, so it makes them uh, very practical, but that's also the reason why they take forever to break down when they are in our environment. So, so some common additives are your plasticizers, so these are chemicals added to make uh, polymers more flexible and less brittle. Your flame retardants, stabilizers, pigments, or colorants, and uh, antioxidants. So these are added to help prevent them from being uh, from breaking down when they're exposed to light or heat. And then lastly, modifiers. So these improve or alter the performance of the polymer. Uh, a very common modifier that we see in plastic bags is a uh, uracemide um, or oleamide. It's a anti-slip agent. Um, so it actually uh, um, prevents the plastic bags from sticking together. So why we're interested in additives and microplastics is that these are usually smaller compounds um, and knowing what is in the polymer itself can help us to create a fingerprint of uh, plastic that's unique to this given polymer or this given piece of microplastic. And then lastly, uh, I just want to touch briefly on some of the mass spec based methods used for microplastic analysis. So one of the very common ones that I'm sure most people are familiar with is matrix assisted laser desorption ionization or moldy mass spectrometry. It's kind of the industry standard for uh, MS based techniques for polymer analysis. It provides very important polymer characterizations such as the uh, molecular mass distribution, repeating unit N group information, and they have a high mass range. Most of these systems average with a maximum M over C value of 300 or 500,000. Um, so MALDI, uh, Bruker already has a couple of MALDI webinars on our website looking at polymer analysis. So I'm not gonna go too in depth about MALDI today. So you can feel free to check those out after today's event. But what I wanna talk about today is actually uh, DART mass spectrometry or direct analysis in real time. So this was a recent acquisition by Bruker. So we're really excited to kind of show off what DART can bring to the uh, Bruker product line. So DART is a simple solution for rapid material characterization and uh, can really help detect those polymer additives and contaminants that we were just talking about in the previous slide. Um, it can also be coupled with high resolution, high mass accuracy systems like our IMPACT-2. And it's great for small molecule detection. So uh, DART has a detection range usually from 50 to up to about 1,000 m over C, so perfect for a lot of these additives. And now I just wanted to briefly show the Bruker Mass Spec product portfolio for our 2023. Uh, the Mass Spec technology continues to evolve and high resolution accurate mass instruments become more and more common in modern polymer analysis labs. So for instance, the Bruker QTOF systems that you see on the top left do not only provide sensitivity on par with conventional nominal mass triple quads, but enable new workflows and applications such as non-targeted analysis and additives or a detailed comparison of multiple samples to detect the smallest differences and uh, deviations. And as mentioned on the previous slide, Bruker has a well-established fleet of moldy tough systems that take polymer analysis to the next level. So Bruker offers uh, a very wide range of multi tough instruments that you can see on the bottom left hand of the slide. Um, and also uh, Bruker is focused on triple quads and we also LC and GC triple quads for efficient non-targeted workflows. And of course, all our instruments are supported by a world-class software, which I'll be uh, able to show you just a, um, a couple programs today. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and step over to the mass spec. So let me swap my camera to tell you a little bit about DART mass spectrometry. Let me just go ahead and zoom out just a bit.
Maybe. There we go. So, as Megan mentioned, now would be a good time to adjust the the camera angle or the uh, the split screen setup. So uh, the image on the screen is just a cutaway of the dart ionization source that I have right here. Um, but yeah, this is the dart ion source. So as you can see in the cutaway, um, on the back end here, we have our high voltage cable as well as a gas supply. So right now this is in standby mode. So we're just flowing nitrogen through the system. But uh, how DART ionization actually works is we flow helium through the back of the, the ion source here. And it flows through a high voltage needle. Uh, it flows through the back and comes into contact with a high voltage needle. From there, what we're producing is um, gas metastables. So these metastables are then passed through a ceramic heater where we can heat them from anywhere between 25 to 500 degrees Celsius. And from that point, uh, we now have a heated metastable gas leaving the ceramic cap up front here. So the metastables are actually what is doing the ionization. So we're not really interested in any of the, um, the, uh, neg uh, the charge particles that are created during this process. We just want those heated metastables. So the heated metastables come into contact with atmospheric water and create these protonated water clusters. And then these water clusters are then come into contact with your sample past that proton to create your ion. So here, I'm just gonna go ahead and reattach that and secure it with this thumb screw. And we're gonna go ahead and zoom in so you can kind of see what's going on under the hood. All right. There we go, sorry about that. So here we have the DART ion source pointed directly at the front end of our quadruple time of flight system, impact two. So we have the ceramic tube here uh, placed in front and this tube actually goes up to the, uh, the API inlet of the mass spec. So that's how we pull ions that are created under ambient conditions and we pull them into the mass spec. So what we have the DART actually attached to today is the Ion Rocket. This is a Ion Rocket is produced by BioCarmato. It's a great attachment for polymer analysis. And I'm going to, to excuse me while I advance my slide here. And you can get a better look at the Ion Rocket setup and how it actually works. So again, the, the Ion Rocket is just a thermal pyrolysis platform. So from here, we take, uh, you get a better image on the screen, but it's this small, copper pot, uh, and then you, you place your, your sample on the inside. So this could be milligrams of sample. Uh, so in the, the picture there, it's just a small piece of a plastic bead. In today's example, I actually have a small, um, small couple fragments of a plastic film that we're gonna go ahead and analyze today. So the, the copper pot is placed onto the, the heater stage of the ion rocket. And then once I have the cover back on, I can go ahead and slide that thermal stage to where it's right underneath this uh, ionization region. So from there, once we heat the, the plastic, anything that vaporizes off of the sample gets introduced to this DART ionization region, it's ionized and then analyzed with our mass spec. So from here, I'm gonna go ahead and pop, cover back on, slide this forward. And we're ready to run. So I'm going to head back to the, the computer here. Switch my camera back over. All right. So what I have in front of me is our Compass High Star system. So our High Star is a uh, allows you to create a sample table and allows you to control multiple diff, um, multiple sets of equipment so they can, they can communicate together. So if you think of the ion rocket or the DART, we're replacing the LC part of this setup. 
And we actually do have contact closure um, communication between the control box right underneath the cart here of the ion rocket and the computer itself. So from here, I can go ahead and pull up the DART control page as well as the Iron Rocket control page. So from here, this is just our free run page. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set the, the DART into its run mode and two things just happened. So uh, the standby gas switched from nitrogen to helium because we're ready to ionize and the high voltage system turned on. So that needle is now creating those charged metas or these helium metastables. So right now we're currently uh, generating ions in the ion rocket. Um, but right now we're just sampling the ambient air. There's nothing there to sample. So now with the ion rocket, we can go ahead and start the, the thermal program that we uh, have set up for you. So this is the ion rocket control page. Again, it's a very simple piece of software. And the Iron Rocket control page allows you to create a thermal program uh, for your uh, desired sample. So it allows you to create uh, multiple presets. You can add, add a line, you can remove lines. So think of it kind of like your, your GC thermal program. So you can select your starting temperature, your ramp rate, uh, any type of hold time. You can add another ramp rate. Anyways, the ion rocket heats the sample anywhere from 50 to 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, and what's great about this is, say your sample, uh, you know it has a higher melting point above 300, so you're really only interested in kind of the, uh, the latter half or the higher temperature range. You can set the, the, you know, the ramp rate to 250, 300 degrees per minute, uh, quickly burn through that lower end of the spectra, uh, or sorry, lower temperature range. And then once you get to that 300 point, you can really slow things down and start to take a look at what comes off at each different temperature interval. And the nice thing about the ion rocket is that it does create uh, a log file. So it does create CSVs for you. I'm gonna go ahead and pop one open just to give you a quick look. And you can see here, uh, it gives you temperature readings at each second. So it's a great way to keep track and then you can match the um, time frame or the time point from your CSV value to the time point on your um, chromatogram. So at this point, we're ready, to, or ready to start running. So I have the DART is running, it's creating ions, it's uh, helium. I slid the sample over so where it's right underneath that ionization region. And from here, we can go ahead and start the ion rocket. That is my fault. One step here I forgot to do is coming back to the high star page. Let's go ahead and stop that. One thing from the, uh, the high star page, it's actually, it might help if I submit the sample. So from here, I, uh, I created the sample ID for our unknown. Um, and let's go ahead and start that sequence. All right, so now that we're actually ready for analysis, we have the, the high star instrument up here saying it's waiting for injection. Our impact tube is ready to go. So let's go back to the ion rocket and start that run. There we go. So let's come back to the high star page. And yeah, we can see here the acquisition has started. We're collecting ions and it'll run its course. Now this is about a five minute run. So it's gonna go ahead and take some time to do that. And while that is running, I'm gonna go ahead and pull open the dark control page just to give you guys another look at it. So this is a web-based uh, web interface um, that controls our page. So this is just a free run page for the DART controller. And what we can see here is you can, you can set the temperature. So you can set it from 25 to 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, 
right now we're just running it at 300. So yes, the ion rocket is creating a lot of heat and it's burning off that sample. Um, but the DART does require a little bit of heat for that gas to really help with ionization efficiency. Another thing that's really great about the DART is the ion rocket is just a one attachment of many. So it's one way to introduce your sample. Uh, so we do offer multiple different modules that can, um, that can uh, enter your sample. And we have the ability to um, create different methods and you can save these presets so you can load those quickly whenever you're ready to run. So we have multiple different modules available that can all be swapped with the ion rocket um, within minutes. So while that is running, we're coming about halfway through our, our run. I'm gonna jump back to my presentation here. and show you some of the sampling techniques that we do have to offer. Um, so we do offer uh, different ways uh, or different types of modules for sample introduction. So we do have the addition of a high throughput system where we can look at sample cards of 96 or 384 samples. So you can really crank through some samples. We have uh, surface scanners. So you can look at the uh, analysis of uh, various surfaces. This is our quick strip card. So it's similar to the high throughput system, except we're just looking at uh, 12 samples at a time. Uh, we have our SPIAC kit. So these are actually solid phase extraction fibers. So we have uh, C18 coated fibers that you can use to extract samples from your matrix and look at those directly uh, with this module. And um, just one last I'm gonna talk about today is the DIPIT module. So this is just similar to the SPIAT modules, but instead of using fibers, we're looking at glass capillaries. So again, these are all different modules that are available to pair with the DART itself, um, allowing the user to have a wide range of applications uh, for DART mass spectrometry. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump back over. Yeah, so our run is just about a minute out. All right, so while that's finishing up. Again, here's just a closer look of the ion rocket um, and the uh, that small copper pot that sits directly. So there's a stream of that heated metastable gas that's flowing right through here. And whatever is being vaporized off of the copper pot will come into contact with that dark ionization region and, uh, and interact with that heated metastable gas to produce ions. Um, so, all right. Let's take a look at the, so that is finishing up. Sorry. All right, so that's finishing up. Let's go back to the DART page. What I'm gonna do here is I'm going to switch this over into standby mode. Oh, and one last thing that I wanted to point out is that the DART is actually capable of doing both positive and negative mode. So again, uh, negative mode can provide a whole new look uh, at the same sample. So that is always a great tool to have. All right, so now that our sample is done, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that open in our data processing software, which is going to be today the uh, data analysis tool. So on my screen now is the uh, compass data analysis. So this is a great way to get a 
a closer look at your software and perform a lot of manipulation and take a look at your data. So I'm gonna go ahead and open what we just collected. My apologies. There. There we go. All right. So what we have here is your kind of your standard chromatogram. Um, Now you can kind of think of this as your uh, kind of like your your GC profile. So as time progresses, we're looking at not just uh, at a different time point, but a different temperature point. Now we can go back to that CSV file uh, file in the um, Ion Rocket control page and match up these time points with what temperature we were currently running at. So from here we can kind of take a look at different temperature points. Now we are running at about a little over half a minute. We were looking at about 150 degrees, 200 degrees. So what we can see here are a, a couple of large ions that are kind of dominating the spectra right now, which is 391, 411, 149. Um, this kind of gives us a look again at the polymer at this, um, at this specific temperature region. But once we go up about another 150 degrees, we start to get a whole new look at this polymer. So again, now we're, we're still seeing that 411, but now we're seeing uh, you know, 369, 256. But even more interesting, what we're now seeing is this begin this, this polymeric distribution. Uh, so we're really starting to break down whatever that plastic was. Once we go just a little bit further. Yeah, so now we're seeing uh, a whole new set of potential additives. And once we look past that, so just go a little bit further, we're really starting to cook the polymer. We're, we're breaking it down. And now what we're seeing is just the pure polymeric distribution of that sample. So once we go ahead, we can copy that to a compound spectra where we can manipulate it just a little bit further. And let me grab my annotation tool. And we can start to, let me zoom in just a little bit closer. We can start to label some of these peaks. Yeah, so here we're having just a separation of C2H4. So what this is telling me, this is likely gonna be um, polyethylene. So polyethylene typically does have a harder time for analysis with MALDI because it doesn't like to dissolve in much. So this uh, thermal pyrolysis platform is a great tool to really break down those tricky, uh, those tricky samples that may, have not, uh, may be resistant to more traditional modes of testing. So what we can do from here is now that we kind of have an idea that okay, we have a polyethylene plastic, now where do we go from here? But well, we can start comparing uh, this profile, this kind of this thermal profile of this given plastic to some standards that we've already ran. So these are some standards that I ran, uh, or some samples that I've, reference samples that I've ran previously this week. And we can go ahead and compare the, the, uh, the chromatogram of our unknown to the different plastics. So here we have plastic F, which was a uh, soda bottle or a beverage bottle. And right off the bat, I'm seeing complete difference in spectra, uh, chromatograms. So without further analysis, um, kind of my gut instinct is telling me these are two different polymers. So let's take a look at plastic H, which was a trash bag. So that's gonna be in blue, our unknown is in the black line. Uh, yeah, we're seeing similar patterns. It's shifted off by about 30 seconds and that just could be the glitch um, that we had with the Ion Rocket software. But we are seeing kind of these three separate peaks followed by this flat line, which is gonna be that polyethylene distribution, uh, which is similar to what we saw 
in our spectra. So that looks like a good candidate. Lastly, plastic bag A, which was bag, uh, a piece of plastic bag um, that came from packaging material. Uh, in the beginning, yeah, we're seeing these kind of these two, uh, these two peaks in the uh, that are similar. However, the profile towards the latter half of the run looks completely different. Um, so let me go ahead and reopen the plastic um, or the plastic H. And what I did earlier this week is I went through and I found specific ions that are significant to this plastic bag. Um, and kind of create its own uh, unique fingerprint. So for example, what I would do is I'd come in here, um, you know, 411 was a good candidate. Remember 411, we were seeing in quite a, uh, in the other one too. Um, you know, 256. So what you can do is actually right click this 256, create a base peak chromat chromatogram with uh, five, with a range of tolerance of five milligram or five millidaltons. And you create its own base peak chromatogram. So what you can do is I, I can went through um, other parts of the spectra and kind of created, let me highlight all of these, a fingerprint. Now this is just four base, uh, four base peak chromatograms. So it's four different ions. You can really expand on this for each uh, reference sample um, to kind of, again, create its own fingerprint monitoring these uh, specific additive ions. So from here, let's go ahead and copy these chromatograms and apply it to our unknown. Let me uncheck that so we can get a full view of it. And paste. All right. So yeah, let me uncheck the base or the, the base peak chromatogram. And yeah, so we're seeing the same three, or sorry, same four base peak chromatograms that were present in the plastic H, which is the trash bag. And now we're seeing it in our unknown. So again, this is just going off four, but again, this is a good indication that these two samples um, are a positive ID of each other. And just to just to show you that I'm not that all of them won't you know work for each other. Let's go ahead and look take a look at the Coke bottle or the uh, the soda bottle. And again, I uh, selected three different ions or four in this case. The 647 is just very low, and that are unique to this Coke bottle or beverage bottle. Let's copy that over to our unknown. And all right, yeah, we're seeing this 411 is very present. So that's just one of them. But once we uncheck and take a look at the other three, 647, 594, and 195, uh, you can make a good case that they're present. Um, you know, definitely, yeah, 195 is there. Um, However, this 647, if you remember, let me go ahead and place the, the entire uh, base peak chromatogram. It's within this flat, this flat region here. So when you remember, when you take a look at it, it's this polymeric distribution. So again, that ion was 647. If you zoom in, let's take a close look at 647. It's be right here. It's, it's no surprise that something is showing up at 647. So I'm, I'm not surprised, um, but that's also why we can take a look at the time in which it came off. So again, let me close that off so we can get a full view, uncheck that. So 647 for our unknown is showing up at about two and a half to three minutes. If we go back to the reference sample that we pulled it from, that's coming off earlier at about a minute and a half. So again, you can make the case that yes, 647 may be present in our uh, unknown, but it's coming off at a much higher temperature than our reference sample. And because I have three references pulled up and we already did two of them, let's go ahead and just take a look at the last one. 
So that'll be this plastic bag A. So again, I found four unique uh, ions that were that were kind of that allowed me to create a fingerprint for this plastic bag. And let's copy and paste those to our unknown. Sorry, let me uncheck that one. And again, yeah, we're seeing this 273, it's very present in our unknown. So we, once we remove that, again, we're left with just this, um, you know, just these kind of very sparse signal at that two and a half to three minute reach. So this, again, these, these, um, these peaks are likely just coming from that polymeric distribution region. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't deem that as a positive match. So just to confirm, I'll delete. Let's go back to plastic bag H. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great match and it kind of overlaps. So we have, you know, the greens, reds and purples coming out. Um, before the blues, so this would lead me to lead me to uh, to say that our unknown is coming from the same source material as this plastic H. And again, one thing to so soda uh, soda bottles are actually made with PET. So one thing you can do before even you know looking at different types of ions uh, or different type of additives, you can let me pull that up. So remember at this two and a half to three and a half minute mark, we are seeing a strong polymeric uh, breakdown of that polyethylene bag. Um, in this case, at this higher temperature for the, the, the beverage bottle, we're not seeing that. And that's because like I said, beverage bottles are made with um, polyethylene uh, phthalate, PET. So we're seeing uh, 193 and that's the, the c 10 h 8 o Four uh, parent chain of PET, and that uh, so we're only going to see a couple of those peaks where you know polyethylene. We, you know we're seeing a, a lot in just a couple hundred span of M over Z. And just to just to reiterate that, I'm going to go ahead back to my slide here. And again, yeah, you, here's a, a good comparison of the polyethylene that we're seeing. Um, so this you know the C2H8. compared to the uh, polyethylene phthalate. So we're seeing it at 192 uh, distribution. So at this point, um, the iron rocket would be, you know, cooled down, ready to go. You can look at, you can load up your next sample. Um, and then from this point, you can really begin, uh, you can really begin to build your library out and start identifying, you know, by buying reference standards of these different additives. Now there's thousands of additives, so it's hard to know where all these are coming from. But again, through uh, even if you don't know what that additive is, if it's present in the sample, uh, you can use it as a marker to, you know, to further identify uh, your unknowns. Uh, so at this point, this concludes the the live demonstration. Um, so we have to hand the mic back over to Megan. But uh, before I do, I'd like to thank you all for uh, sitting through some of our technical glitches, but also for joining me today. Uh, like I said, it's a nice snowy day. So what better day to uh, you know, sit at home and watch this event. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you, William. Thank you. I really appreciate the live demonstration and it really shows how quick you can get from point A to point B. So thank you very much. And yes, we are enjoying a very nice and snowy day here in Bilrica. I hope that you guys, wherever you are in the world, are enjoying something a little bit more warm. Uh, I'm going to monitor the chat over here. It looks like there's a couple questions, if you indulge me. Uh, the first one, William, are the copper pots reusable? So it's yes or no. Um, so they are designed to be as a, a consumable. So you can buy a packs of a, a hundred or a thousand from bio uh, from us. Um, however, I actually have one right here. 
once the copper pots are, are, are used, they turn from that nice shiny copper color to this kind of burnt out color. Now it is just pure copper. So if you want to clean them with some type of acid solutions and, and test them to make sure they're clean, uh, by all means, you can do that. But uh, they are designed to be as a, a one and done kind of use. So okay. just depends if you want to you know, go through the extra steps of cleaning them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, since you're using helium as the ionization gas, how much is actually used? Yeah, so that's always a, a big question for DART. You know, he helium is becoming a hotter and hotter topic as it's becoming more and more abundant. Um, and I forgot to mention the box in front of the DART is the controller for the powering gases. So the gas is actually regulated down to 3.2 liters a minute. Um, and as you saw, we are running um, a, about a five minute run. So you can toggle, you know, go back to uh, nitrogen, you know, once you're done with the run. Um, but to kind of give you guys an example, I have a standard, you know, helium tank sitting next to the instrument. And this has lasted me well over, uh, you know, close to two months, two and a half months now. Um, so the iron rocket d does require helium, but it's a, a, a very small flow. Um, so one tank can really last you uh, quite some time. Thank you, William. All right, next question. Can the ion rocket be used for other materials besides microplastics? Yes. So again, anything you can fit in that copper pot, uh, you know, can be can be used in the ion rocket. Um, plastics is just a great um, a great example because you know you can slowly really bake off um, and that nice controlled heating um, program, like I said, gives you that chromatogram that I showed. Uh, but anything you can fit, a very common application too is those synthetic fibers. Um, so again, those are plastic, so that's another, but uh, you can place liquid in the copper pots. You can use, um, place dust. Uh, so again, whatever you can fit in those copper pots and whatever can be, uh, you know, pyrolysized, uh, is a great application for the iron rocket. All right, and final question, can you use N2 for the ionization gas? I'm sorry? The final question is, can you use N2 for ionization yes. gas? Yeah, so uh, you can use nitrogen as the ionization gas. That is a, a setting that you can change into the, the DART software. Um, so what, why we prefer to use helium, we usually get a, a stronger um, and more efficient ionization with helium over nitrogen. But for, for people who are doing general um, method development or who are going to be doing a lot of like runs to get the hang of it um, and want to use nitrogen, um, it, works, it, works, it works well. I mean, it's, uh, we usually get cleaner spectra, less background noise from, the, from using helium, but nitrogen works great too. Excellent. Thank you, William. And that looks like the end of our chat box over here. So again, I wanted to thank William Fadigante for such an excellent presentation and all of our audience for coming to watch this live demonstration today. So thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. And I hope this was uh, delightful and informative for you. All right. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone. Right. Goodbye, everybody.